Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another AP Environmental Science screencast with your teacher, Mr. Stano. And today we're going to look at it, our aquatic biodiversity, or really our salt water life zones or biomes, however you may want to call them. These areas have roughly a salinity of 3%, and that can vary a little bit, um, but uh, definitely separated out from our freshwater zones looking at that salinity. Our oceans uh, can be divided up into a number of different life zones. All in all, those life zones together are worth roughly $12 trillion per year, and they also provide numerous amounts of ecosystem services for us uh, besides just fish and whatever we pull from it as far as what we need uh, for food. There are three major life zones, like I said, and the first, and these are going to be separated out by the depth of the water and how far we are from that shoreline. Looking at our continental shelf in this zone, so here this is all of our continental, and then we drop off, and then we go into the deeper waters um, that we get a number of different layers. Our euphotic zone is basically going to have the highest amount of light, and then as we go down, there's less light. What we see though, as we go deeper down, there's more nutrients. So as we get deeper, there's more nutrients. All this marine snow or this sediment uh, from these organisms is going to go deeper and deeper down, uh, but the light penetration is less and less. So what we see is this transition from photosynthetic up to here, up at the top in our euphotic zone, uh, moving down into a different type of organisms down on the bottom and some chemosynthesis going on to near uh, hydrothermal vents. Then we look at our region right here, our coastal zone or intertidal right up here and then moving out into our open sea. So you can see we have this horizontal and vertical distribution of our life zones. Our first ones that we're gonna do are coastal zones and there are a number of different coastal zones. We're gonna go over them briefly, but we'll spend more time in class on these. These areas have a tendency to be warm, nutrient rich uh, with shallow water. They extend from the high tide mark all the way to the edge of the continental shelf like I showed in that previous diagram, which is a good diagram to have down makes up roughly 10% of the world's ocean area, so not much, but contains 90% of the marine species. There's a lot going on here. Because the light penetrates through this region, we have a high net primary productivity per unit area. And they're covered with water year round or most of the year. These areas can be estuaries, mangroves, coral reefs, and a number of different seashores that we'll be going over. Estuaries, uh, which here on Long Island, play a huge part for our ecosystem stabilities and also provide a good economic resource as far as fish coming into and out of these regions. But the estuaries, you can see all of Long Island or every sh almost every shoreline within Long Island is considered an estuary or has estuaries in it. Uh, these are nothing more than where rivers meet the sea and they're partially enclosed seawater uh, mixes with the freshwater and due to tidal uh, movements of uh, high to low tide moving water into these streams and then fresh water out and just like we could see with this diagram if the tide comes in salt water will move up and if the tide goes out fresh water move that way so we have organisms adapted to a variety of conditions our seagrass beds very similar uh, consists of a number of different plants that are able to grow in shallow water rooted within this salt water. Um, highly complex regions, uh, stabilize shorelines, and reduce wave impact. So they do play a good service for us. And here, um, these are examples of seagrass, and you can see actually the fish out and back of here. Interestingly enough, if we go out towards Sag Harbor and another east end uh, places on Long Island, they are replacing... Um, their seagrass beds they're actually growing uh they make these big wreaths and they set them out sink them and they grow to replenish whatever seagrass has been lost this is just a revitalization project no need to worry about that here uh in these regions because there's a huge amount of tidal flow uh there's daily changes seasonal changes and pretty much hourly changes to these areas so these organisms have to be adapted to that so we see a low biodiversity of plants and animals due to these changing conditions. Um, we see a number of different shorebirds, fish hatcheries, shellfish, and crabs, and we can see here as we go through, just some of the organisms like the striped bass and seabirds, shorebirds that are in the area. Moving over, we go into our mangrove forest. Uh, pretty cool regions, if you ask me. So we're found in tropical regions here, gently sloping, sandy, and silty coastline. And you'll see how that kind of plays in with what's actually growing. About 70 species of tree can grow in salt water. And there you have an extensive root system, which makes them cool, that extends above the water line so that they can obtain oxygen when submerged and any other gas exchanges that need to happen. 
just like we have here. So this mangrove, you can see these pretty amazing or extensive root system for the tree that stabilizes hold it and holds the area together. And this is looking at it from above and below the ground. Uh, they maintain water quality. They filter toxins and pollutants, fixes nutrients and sediments. So a lot happens here with the mangroves. Uh, because they stabilize that shoreline, just like our seagrass beds, they help reduce storm damage. Uh, but they do provide habitat for a number of other organisms that are around. What we have noticed or seen is that removing mangroves from an area actually allows for saltwater intrusion to occur. So mangroves help prevent saltwater intrusion, which we'll talk about uh, within a unit or two. Then we have our rocky and sandy shores. These areas are intertidal zones, so the area where we have high to low tides. And just like we see in estuaries, mangroves, and our seagrass beds, the organisms have to deal with a variety of different conditions. Our rocky shores, just like the name implies, uh, are going to be a little bit more complex. You'll see these uh, seasonal and pooling conditions in the areas, much like we have here. Uh, not, not too extreme as we see on the North Shore, but uh, this is uh, pretty good what we'll see up in Maine and a number of regions like that. And just some lobsters and other organisms that hang out within these pools, within these tidal areas. Our sandy shores uh, or barrier beaches that we can have on Long Island. Uh, organisms hide burrow and tunnel to avoid being seen. Uh, definitely like the name, name implies, a little bit more sandy. Barrier islands that we have on Long Island, they're going to be parallel to the coastline, and we'll see this in a number of different places besides Long Island. And there's rows of sand dunes. Typically, we have two, a front closer to the ocean and a back or rear uh, sand dune. And these sand dunes are held in place by whatever plants that are going to be growing in area. Uh, one of the big thing about barrier islands is they do protect the mainland from storms, so they are important to our, especially here on Long Island, um, just something you may not want to live on. So here's a breach on a barrier island uh, that was out east a number of years ago. And you can see here that the bay water can now enter the ocean and vice versa and go through. Typically, these are not a bad things, and they do change from season to season. Uh, a lot of places, uh, light, as far as the bay's health is considered, these are good because it allows for a better exchange of water. So whatever pollutants or whatever um, nutrients may be in there, it allows for a quicker removal of them. So breaches within our barrier islands are not necessarily such a bad thing, and they open and close on their own. And here's just looking at the barrier islands all the way along our shoreline. You can see all the way going up to Smith's Point, uh, Fire Island, and jo hitting towards Jones Beach. And this is just looking at a cross section of the dunes themselves. And like I said, they have that front dune and rear, but that front dune may change depending on the conditions. And in the winter, our storm waves are a little bit more stronger, and you'll see that movement of that sand. So there's always a natural ebb and flow to these dunes where they'll build up, break down, build up, and break down. And just another review of them when you're building on them. And those are the plants, uh, a restoration project to help protect the dunes so people will plant grass and help stabilize them so they don't suffer any wind damage or any other damage. Coral reefs are uh, a pretty interesting area also. They're oldest, most diverse on the planet, uh, but the most productive systems in the world. And they're equivalent to basically our tropical rainforests home to about a quarter of all marine species. So once again, the biodiversity in these areas is huge. Uh, here's some example of corals. But the corals themselves are nothing more than colonies of tiny living animals uh, found in marine waters that contain few nutrients. And underwater structures, uh, structures sorry, made up of calcium carbonate should be created by the corals. And these provide a home for the zooanthellae that live inside them. So here, a little cross-section. This is the coral polyp secretes a skeleton that allows for the zooanthellae to live in these regions here. And what that does is they provide photosynthesis for this, and they'll provide them with structure and any other uh, necessities that they may need. So we have a nice symbiotic relationship going on here. So since the coral, like I said, does not photosynthesize, but the zooanthellae do, we have a sy uh, symbiotic relationship between the two. And just as the zooanthellae inside these spaces secreted by the coral polyp. Okay, coral reefs provide a number of services between tourism, fisheries, and shoreline protection, helping reduce wave impact. 
Okay, but they are very fragile and sensitive to temperature change. So what we see with this global warming, with sea surface temperatures changing, that these areas are exhibit are symptomatic of having a lot of problems. Moving through now, away from the shoreline into our open sea, we have a sharp increase in water depth. We're past that continental shelf, and we're moving outwards. Per unit area, the net primary productivity is low, but because there is so much ocean, we have a high net primary productivity as a whole. There's three vertical zones based on light penetration, like I said before, our euphotic, bathal, and abyssal zones. So our euphotic zone right at the top, brightly lit, and it's gonna contain most of our phytoplankton. The nutrient levels are low, and the, but the dissolved oxygen is high. There's a lot of mixing with the atmosphere there, so gas exchange is easy between the water and the atmosphere. We see here larger, faster swimming predatory fish, sharks, tuna, and swordfish. And here we go right there, the tuna. And there we go. But the bathal zone is dimly lit. Going deeper down, uh, no producers. But what we see is zooplankton and small fish will migrate from this bathal up into that UV and photic zone up on the top. What ends up happening here is they'll do this daily migration uh, to avoid predation, uh, at night they'll move down, and then during the day they'll go, oh, sorry, and they'll migrate to the surface at night to feed when they're less visible. Go, oh, this is squid. Some whales that will travel between the zones. Okay, then we move into our abyssal zone. This is the deep ocean. Um, dark, cold, little dissolved oxygen in these areas, high in nutrients, uh, no sunlight penetrating down. We have nutrients in the form of marine uh, snow, which is basically dead and decaying organisms uh, sinking to the bottom. So we see worms, deposit feeders, that'll take in mud and extract nutrients. And we have things like oysters, clams, sponges that'll pass water through or over their body to do this also. And just some organisms that we see in the bottom. And back to this. So we've gone through our zones, the hiddle, the deepest and bottom part. Right there, we haven't gone over, but similar to what we see in our abyssal zone. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed this screencast on our saltwater life zones or biomes. And that's about it. Bye for now.